Hello and welcome to this episode of the Star Wars Universe podcast. My friends, The Bad Batch is up. Season 2, Episodes 1 and 2 are live, and we are talking about it here on the Star Wars Universe podcast. We're going to be doing episode-by-episode coverage every week with myself and Aaron McGowan. Right after this commercial break, we have no control over Welcome back. I'm Matthew, your host, they, them pronouns. I'm joined, as I said, by Aaron McGowan, a uh, Soka cosplayer and Star Wars enthusiast. Aaron, we are back to the Bad Batch. How are you feeling about it? Oh my God, I'm so excited. I cannot wait to talk about this. I can't wait to do this whole season. These first two episodes were fantastic. Yeah. You know, if nothing else, I'm glad they listened to us because we talked about how, like, Tech didn't really have too much of an identity and we kind of wanted a little more of him. And now he's the – he's Professor Tech. Yes. You know, now he's the one who's homeschooling Omega. So yes. I'm, I'm down for it. And they did the same with Echo. Like, I was mm-hmm. – you know, last season we talked about Echo didn't have much going on, didn't really have much for character arcs. But, like, they had that whole moment with him in Omega and just – I just loved Echo these two episodes. Definitely, definitely. So, all right. So, let's get back to the show itself. Um, how are you feeling kind of as we were getting ready to watch the show last night or this morning for you? Like, you would had so much anticipation for this build up. Yes. Um, I will say I'm not the smartest when it comes to time zones. So, I genuinely <laughs> thought it came out at 10 p.m. last night, not 2 a.m. Oh, no. <laughs> and I was so excited. I had an alarm set and everything. And then I checked. And then you texted me saying only four hours left. And I was like, Oh, it's 2 (laughs) a.m. Okay. (laughs) So I went to bed and I got up this morning to watch it. Um, I've never been so excited to hear my alarm, you know? I was like, let's go. Um, But yeah, I really enjoyed the episodes. How about you? I did. I did. I um, I thought they did a good job of kind of like bringing us back in, reminding us of where things were happening. Um, Not that much happened in these episodes, I thought. But I thought I did a good job of kind of like setting the stage, reminding us of where everyone is. And setting up what I think are going to be some of the big stories, especially in terms of the Empire, which is where a lot of the stuff that I was most interested in was happening. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. They weren't like – it wasn't the same depth and like meatiness we got with the like original Mm -hmm. two episodes of the first season, the like premiere episode, um, because that had a lot of like backstory to fill in. But I agree. It was nice like reminder like this is where everyone is. I liked the little – kind of ways that they showed how Omega has grown and how she's grown into more of the team. Like mm-hmm. they're going to leave the ship on Sereno to do whatever their mission is, you know, and Omega is kind of on the ship and Hunter looks back and is like, are you coming? Yeah. It's like, it's not even a question if she's staying on the ship anymore. It's she's just coming. She's part of the team now, which I appreciated. I kind of liked that growth from season one to season two. Definitely. And, and in terms of growth, she looks a little bit older. Um, yes. I think it's still like – I think only about six months have passed. It's not a huge amount of time, but she it looks like like you know pu- puberty is coming. <laughs> mm-hmm. She's grown a bit. I like her new hair. It's super cute. Mm-hmm. But yeah. that little like uh, flight cap thing she has going on too, it's just so very Omega because she's not like yeah. overly feminine, I don't think. And I think that mm-hmm. just fits in perfectly with her character. Agreed. Agreed. Because there's definitely a, a one of the boys aspect to her in terms mm-hmm. of the team. And I think – uh, we talked a little bit about like you know her gender is a very interesting question in terms of like where did that come from in terms of is uh, did did they do something with the genetic code to to in that regard or is she you know just trans and, and choosing to to present as female like we don't know mm-hmm. um, and that's gonna be a whole interesting question I think that I don't know if they're actually gonna explore that that degree of it but it'd be interesting to know what her history is and but seeing the way she presents evolving I think it's been really fun. One thing that I realized, I know we saw it happen last season, but I don't remember, and I'm wondering how much of a connection there is here. She's still using the laser bow that mm-hmm. she has, that I think she found at some point in season one. Yeah, it's a Zygerian slaver, like, laser bow. Okay, that's right. That's right. They're fighting the slavers. Mm-hmm. Now, the only time we've seen a bows like that be used quite regularly, and I guess others have used them a lot, but was with the the Night Sisters, the mm-hmm. um, the Dark Side Force users who were not Sith, but they did use the Dark Side. Who uh, Ventress Asajj comes from? She she was part of that group. Do you think there's any kind of like connection there with with Omega using that bow? Is it just you know 
they happen to use a bow. Other people use the bow. She's using the bow. Is it just like a coincidence there? What's Because they had her very prominently using the bow, and I loved it, but it just got me thinking more about that. Okay. Um, yeah, I liked her bow. I think that it's kind of just a way to incorporate other parts of this universe. Mm-hmm. That's not just like a blaster or a weapon that we see used often. Right. And, you know, she's like a different type of clone. So she needs a different type of weapon, I think. I think that works, especially because we did have something in the first season about how at first she didn't have the strength to pull it all the way back. And Uh so it's a nice kind of, you know, a blaster can be literally like a point and click weapon. Like, you know, I mean, the the rifles, you got to be pretty strong to hold them. And that's part of she may not be big enough for some of those rifles. But yeah, but I think it, it... like you said, her being a part of the team is no longer in question. Her being able to use this weapon is no longer in question at all either. Mm-hmm. Um, by the end of last season, she was using it pretty well. And here, she's using it just fine. Yeah, she's definitely – it's like it requires more skill and she's growing those skills. Yeah. One thing I noticed was that like last season, for the most part, our heroes are using a stun setting uh, against the other troopers. Uh, and you can always tell because instead of it being a laser, it's like a series of, uh, you know, getting bigger uh, blue circles that go out. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we've seen this all the way back to the stun weapon that was used against Princess Leia at the start of A New Hope. I couldn't tell. Does the bow have a stun setting? I don't think that it does. I don't think it does either. I think. Uh-huh. Yeah, I don't know if that's like purposeful of them to just like, oh, well, Omega really needs to protect herself. So we're just going to give her something for protection. Right. Or if it's more just like, this is the weapon she likes, so this is the one she's going to use. Right. Makes sense. Yeah. Who knows? So so we got a little bit more of tech. Um, what else? Let's talk more about the other characters themselves. Um, Hunter, we did not see any more of his tattoo, unfortunately. So we're still going to have to canonically it is I'm neck up. Out hope. But who knows what else there is. Uh, but yeah, what would you think of some, uh, some of the Bad Batch we got to check in with? Um... I just want to say my favorite thing was that the first shot, you know, we see this beautiful, like, island, and then out of the forest comes flying Echo, who just immediately eats it straight into the water. And I thought that was so very Echo of him. Like, what a clumsy little man. I just thought it was so sweet. Um, Yeah, this is not a team that is, like, like, it was this beautiful, like, nature shot. These are not, like... Rangers, you know, no, <laughs> these, are, yeah. these are barbarians in D&D terms. <laughs> they are not at one with nature. No, no. Yeah. Um, I really like I mentioned before, I liked how we got more of Echo. And, you know, he made that comment at the start. He says to Hunter something along the lines of like, we live this life because we took Omega. Like we're on the run right. because of her. And so like we really need to be like turning a profit and making sure that we have, like, like we're already on the run. We might as well be doing something against the Empire, I right. think is kind of the conclusion he's come to since we saw him last. Because mm-hmm. before he was kind of like, oh, you know, don't want to work with any Separatists. The Empire sucks, but, like, we're just out here on our own. And I think they all really had that mindset. Right. And I like to see it slowly, like, turning and changing. I also liked at the start of the episode when Sid gives them the mission Uh and Hunter says no, I liked that the rest of them took a vote and they decided they did want to do the mission for, you know, whatever reasons, whether they wanted to have money to be able to hide or disappear or, you know, Echo, as we find out, is really wanting to take that and fight the Empire. And Hunter agrees with them. He's like, okay, you know, it's very um, diplomatic of them, I guess. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Something I noticed that leadership can come in a lot of different ways. There can be, you know, there can be the idea of like, I am the leader, my power comes from above me, and so you just have to listen. But it also can be, you all have kind of made me the leader because having a leader is helpful. But still, at the end of the day, I, I have to do what we all want to do. And I thought Hunter's being willing to sort of not just say, here's what I think, uh, was really great. The other thing was, You know, it's funny. Sometimes if you repeat the same trope in many different parts of the same kind of overall universe, I'm going to get tired of it. But in this case, I think they're doing something throughout Star Wars that I really love, which is that But whether it was back to Rebels or Andor or this or at a different time period, Resistance, but especially with those three things and with some other stuff as well, 
we're seeing so many different stories of how do people come to decide to fight the empire? You know, what's the process of? And so we saw that with Rogue One, uh, with uh, Rebels. We saw that with, like I said, with Andor. We're seeing it, and here especially because I think, to me, the story of people who were in the military, who were gonna just be good soldiers and follow orders, and then they started to break away from that. And so then the question becomes, well, what do we do next? Do we, do we follow some other orders? Do we join some other fight? Or do we just go and hide? Do we just run away from it all? And seeing their process of, okay, no, maybe we should go and fight again. Um, I, I'm really enjoying it. And yeah, I love that Echo is kind of the one who's pushing most for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it makes a lot of sense for them as a team. I understand why we didn't get there in season one. You know, they were figuring out how to be fathers. <laughs> yep. I like to think of actually, I like to think of Echo as kind of the mom because he's just a little more disappointed, a little harsher about things. And also um, when Echo, Tech, and Omega were at that, um, the house of the Serenian man, his name was right. Romar. When right. they were at Romar's okay. house, kind of hiding, waiting to meet up with Hunter and Wrecker. And Tech and Romar are working on this thing. Tech gets it to work, and Romar's super excited. And Echo was watching the perimeter. He walks in. First thing, he goes, where's Omega? And they're both, oh, well, she was right there. Echo goes, well, she's not now. And just runs out the door. <laughs> Yeah, it's nice seeing them find kind of some of their own identities and it being this like – because at first it's like, oh, it's like, you know, four and a half dad, you know, four dads and a kid or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. But no, it's like there's – you know, Wrecker's an uncle. Wrecker's yes. never going to be daddy. He He's he's very much the um, older brother. He's just as much of a kid as you are figure. Uh, Hunter is obviously dad. Um Dad, you know, daddy, papa, yes. Yeah, we, all, all those things. <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, Crosshair is daddy, but in a very different way, as we'll mm -hmm. discuss later. Um, but yeah, and so to have that, have Echo and, and Tech all sort of finding their own identities in the family, I really enjoy. I also thought, and I think this is kind of maybe the emotional heart of the episodes we talked about, it really gave them a chance to explore, and, and in some painful ways for Omega herself, what her role in all of this is. Because... When Echo is saying that, you're right. He means it in – I think he means it in a, hey, let's just be realistic. Omega joining the team does fundamentally change things. He doesn't think that's bad, but he wants to just name it. But he says it in a way that Omega hears and I think takes as she's a burden, she's the problem. And so she has to – you know, she's got both um, Ro Ro Romar. Romar, yeah. She's got both Romar and Sid both kind of telling her, like, look, just be a kid for a little while. And she feels like she can't because of all this burden that she feels is on her. How do you kind of feel about, like, seeing her go through all that? Yeah, it was it was interesting. It was a little relatable, too. I think yeah. kids, especially kids who deal with harder things younger in their life, are very aware of, like, how they're affecting others. And I think it's very common to feel that you're a burden or that you're weighing others down and preventing them from like going on in their lives. So like, I think what Echo said, I agree, had no ill intention. I also think he said it pretty fine, you know, but yeah. like Hunter caught on immediately that like, if Omega hears this, like she's going to be crushed. Like she's going to take it the wrong way. She's not going to understand. So he grabs Echo and pulls him away. But Omega does still hear, and she takes that as, I'm the reason we're on the run, therefore I need to be the one to fix it. I need to be the one right. to get us this, um, what do they call it, like, war? The war stash. The yeah. war stash, something like that, yeah. She sees war that chest, she, that was it. There it is, the war chest. She sees that she needs to, like, be the one to do that and get them the money so that they can escape and whatnot. And Echo's the one who really talks her down and is like... You need to let it go. Like, yeah, money is not what it all comes down to. Like, Romar says to her, she asks, he hands her this little kaleidoscope thing. And she looks in, she sees all these sparkly things. And she's like, oh, are there jewels in here? And Romar goes, no, it's a toy. He goes, blast sake, it's a toy. It makes you happy. And believe yeah. me, that's worth far more than any jewel. And so I think that's, that's kind line. of the lesson we're trying to teach Omega this episode mm -hmm. is that like the people you're around in the small, like 
things that bring you joy, the beautiful things of life are what matter more than treasure and money. Yeah. And especially, I mean, that was something that she found in season one. You know, she was the one who would sometimes play games or enjoy the Martell mix or things like that. And I think we saw over the course of the season her kind of lose that as she gets wrapped up in all the missions with the team. And and so, yeah, I think there'll be a really nice story of seeing her, you know, find that balance of being part of the team, not being treated as a kid, but also getting to be a kid to some extent. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Still getting to experience new things because if we're being honest, she still hasn't experienced much, right? Yeah. She's been out of Topoka City for a couple of months, I think, at this point. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't it's... that long ago that she was, like, touching ground for the first time. And, exactly. Like, just by it. And was so excited. I would love to see more of that, just her discovering the world. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Definitely. And so, of course, we also do get a good deal of the Empire here. Uh, the Empire is back to using clone soldiers, which I thought was pretty cool. We'd seen in the, the last episode, the last season, there had been this beginning of the attempt to recruit non-clone soldiers and some back and forth with that. And Tarkin wanted to get rid of the whole program. And and now it seems like, like I, I'm guessing that this means that the the question of what happens to the clones is something I think we're going to address in this season because we definitely got – Having the clones be back, but then also having this that great scene at the very end of the uh, clone captain, um, you know, not wanting to, to falsify an order, wanting to be like, no, this is what happened. We need to tell people. And the Imperial yeah. officer killing him basically because of it. Um, I, I think this, this conflict between the clones and the Empire is definitely going to come to a head. Yeah, I agree. I That last scene that you mentioned... It really hit me. Like, I'm just such a clone lover. I was like, no. Mm-hmm. Like, I was in the middle of writing down, because I have notes. I was in the middle of writing down, Rampart's corruption is out of control. Rampart, that's yep. the Imperial officer's name. And I was writing that because, you know, he said, oh, you won't falsify the report? I will. And as I'm writing this, I look up, and he shoots Captain Wilco. Yep. And then we get this wide shot of Wilco's body falling off this ledge, just down yep. into the abyss. And it was just like, it came out of nowhere for me. I mean, watching it the second time, you can into it, but I mm-hmm. didn't see it coming. And I, like, it just really hit me. I was like, oh, like, they're just taking out the clones just left and right. Like, they don't care, you know, yeah. if you're not willing to go with us, bye. Yeah. Like, I, I definitely thought that. I could tell there was tension there, and I was like, oh, this is interesting. Like, it's going to be fun over the next bunch of episodes to watch these two kind of do bureaucratic in- – oh, nope, he's dead. He's okay, immediately that's, dead. That's, that's – we, we, we left right – that escalated quickly. Um, Wilco did not deserve that. He was just trying to do his job. He was just following orders? Is yeah. That what um, yeah, exactly. He's just not- following orders. <laughs> uh, who is Wilco? Is he a clone we've really gotten to know beforehand? No, I just love to catch on to their names and like carry that with yep. me. I like to think of them individually like that. I did notice yeah. one really awesome thing about his character. Like he looked just like any other clone, same haircut, same white armor. He had the little captain's like paladin, maybe is what that's mm-hmm. called on his shoulder. But um, just listening and watching the episode, he has a different, like a very distinct voice. Yeah. And thinking about it, you know, this is all D. Bradley Baker playing every single one of these main characters except for Omega. And the um, it's just, I'm always blown out of the water by his talent to be able to not only differentiate all of the Bad Batch, but even you're just given this random clone captain for these two episodes, and you yep. come up with your own voice and your own inflections for him. And that's still different from every single trooper that comes up and reports to him. They still sound different than him. And yeah, so that's just he, something I appreciated about Wilco. I, I realized it was something we hadn't really talked about much uh, when we did the primer of season one, but it is D. Bradley Break <laughs> D. Bradley Baker, his voice acting on this show, the fact that I realized at one point I could close my eyes and and hear each clone voice in the Bad Batch at least and immediately know who was speaking. It's all the same voice actor. 
it is it really is just incredible and i really love that the show is getting to showcase what he's doing with his voice and things like that and i know that there are i'm at a later point going to mention the unwhitewash the bad batch movement which i think is raising some real concerns about how they're portrayed especially because they're all based on Django fett who's played by a maori man tomorrow morning tomorrow morrison uh and that is d bradley baker the voice you know it's the voice of a white man for them there's a lot of interesting concerns that are raised there that i think are worth getting into but but I will just say like his voice acting is, uh, I've listened to so little voice acting overall that saying best of anything never really makes sense. But it is, it is a fairly unparalleled achievement, at least is my understanding of having one person be able to voice so many different characters so well that you're right. Like a one off. This isn't Rex. This isn't Wolf. This isn't mm-hmm. someone who we know really well. This is a one off character, but he still has a unique identity based on his voice. Yeah. It's very impressive. One of the other things I think I really like about this is that, as you said, this isn't just like the empire trying to empire it the best possible way. This is corruption coming in. This is starting to be, let's cover things up. Let's let's make sure that the paper trail shows things doing their best. And this is something that I think some other great commentators talked about with Andor a lot. We touched on somewhat, is that this is one of the fundamental problems of any kind of authoritarian structure, of any kind of fascism or empire or what have you, is that when people get severely punished, if the records don't look proper, then they fake the records, you know, and and seeing, and we, I think by the time of Andor, we saw that happening all the time with, you know, murders being covered up and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And the fact that here we're seeing it, we're maybe like, we're literally six or seven months, maybe a year into the empire having taken over and like... People should know that the Bad Batch is still out there. Like from the perspective of the Empire, they want to know that this clone force is out there. And this guy covering it up is going to hurt the Empire, but it's going to cover his own ass. Mm-hmm. And so seeing that happen so quickly in the Empire, I, I really loved it. Yeah. Yeah. It really shows like how far these people who are placed in power in a corrupt and like fascist government, how far they will go to keep their power. Right. Because it's the only thing like saving them or the only thing keeping them from being trod on by the Empire. Yeah. I think it's really true. I think it's really true. What else was in your notes? What other stuff did you want to bring up? I liked um we only saw a moment of it, but A Z, Omega's little droid, her medical yeah. partner, was a serving droid at SIDS. I just thought that was really sweet. He's just I hope he come becomes like a reoccurring character, and I'm sure he probably will as just the quirky little serving guy that's always spilling right. drinks. Right. And he's the same kind of droid who we saw in the episodes of the Clone Wars when Five was figuring out the whole deal with the chip. He um, is the same droid. He is the same actually, droid, literally. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, even better then because I thought he, that was such a harrowing story, and he was both – he, he he gave some good comedy in that episode in those episodes, but also really gave, I think, a lot of emotional weight to it. You really mm-hmm. cared about his character, and that story is so fundamental to the question of like who are the clones? Why did Order sixty six happen? And the the Bad Batch to me feels like such a continuation of that particular story arc that to have that same droid involved feels really appropriate. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. It. I didn't realize that the first couple times I watched Bad Batch and then I was watching those episodes with Fives and I was like, wait a minute, AZ and then 25 numbers? I know this guy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, yeah, that was definitely fun. Um, we continue to see that the galaxy has an economy that doesn't seem to understand credit cards or, you know, credit lines because all of the wealth of Serrano is just stuff. <laughs> literally <laughs> shiny you know? and heavy things <laughs> I, I you know like there's no bank heists happening you know no one's getting to like you know move stuff from a uh alderanian uh bank account to anywhere else which is you know that's fine that's that's how the economy works here um yeah so i think that was about all i had was there anything else from your your notes that you wanted to comment on yeah, I mean, I just really liked seeing more of Sereno. It's mm-hmm. a planet we haven't seen too much of. I think maybe a couple, like, one-off shots of Count Dooku there. But we did have that episode with the Night Sisters in the Clone Wars where they go to assassinate Count Dooku in his palace yep. at Castle Sereno. So it's the same place um, where we find Hunter and Wrecker kind of pinned down. Yeah. 
And I just liked that reusal of a cool, like, castle design, you know? Yeah. And I liked that it was included and it was, like, mentioned, like, oh, this is Count Dooku's, but it wasn't super important, you know? Yeah. It was just one more piece of world building. And you're right. We yeah. haven't seen much of Serrano. We saw a lot of it in the book, The Dark Disciple. We saw a lot yes. of it in the book, Dark Disciple, but haven't seen a lot of it in the show itself. Um, but yeah, I've been really appreciate. I really appreciated that, especially. And this is one of those like, I feel like Star Wars is getting to a point where they're doing like the Easter egg thing, very well. Where it's a, a, the whole conversation about Easter egg is one that I sometimes roll my eyes at because I don't. I to me, what I like isn't, hey, look, we're putting in a cameo, just put it in. But we're making a reference to something that makes sense, you know, callback of if you miss it, you're not missing anything. But if you get it, you're going to – it's going to deepen the story for you. One of the things that they established a little bit in in the Clone Wars themselves, but especially in Tales of the Jedi and in the book uh, Jedi Lost uh, or Dooku Jedi Lost – is that Dooku went back to Serrano in part because he he wanted to help the people there. Like he had, and it, it was a very much noblesse oblige. These are his his people to rule. He's part of the ruling family, but he did genuinely care about the people, you know. And as he fell more and more to the dark side, that went away. But so he genuinely thought that like the Clone Wars were going to hurt, you know, the coming conflict was going to hurt his, you know, his planet, and he wanted to protect them from it. And so having Roman talk about how. You know, Count Dooku only cared for himself and didn't care about the people. It was heartbreaking in a way, you know, because it was just a one more reminder of like Dooku might have started with this idea, but as he fell, like that went totally by the wayside. And and the people certainly don't remember him as having sacrificed himself for Serrano. Instead, they see him as like having come to, to take to take wealth from Serrano. Yeah. Yeah. It's like he's not just like a Sith Dark Lord and a war criminal. He's also – gaining major profit from this he's a count he's living in a castle he has anything he could possibly want and he's just taking it from everyone right because that's just the spoils of war you know as is the name of the first episode exactly exactly well there's gonna be a lot more about the show to talk about a lot more about the characters to talk about and there's a little bit more bonus content we're still gonna get into let me first just kind of start wrapping up a conversation by saying that along with all the great conversations that are happening around this show itself, there's a larger conversation happening about how the show is being made and, and some of the issues involved. Um, and if you're on TikTok, if you're on Twitter, you might have seen the hashtag unwhitewash the bad batch. And this is a movement talking about that there's a lot of evidence and I, I my my vision is quite bad. I don't notice color stuff as much, but I trust the people who are seeing these things that and when I say I don't see color, I don't mean that in a like racism way. I mean like literally like uh, the colors I see on a screen, often it's hard for me to identify specific things uh, in terms of gradations. But there is a uh, – a lot of people have been pointing out ways in which that the clones who are all based on, as I said, tomorrow Morrison, a Mao reactor, and that they've always been coded as, as – they've always been drawn as people of color, that for the Bad Batch especially – they are whiter in skin tone and that this raises a lot of issues and questions, particularly because they're kind of like the genetically superior versions of it. And, and there's just all kinds of problems around this. And there was a big movement at the end of the first season to kind of say, hey, can you please animate them in a more accurate style? Uh, that hasn't happened yet. And there's a big movement around this. Uh, as I said, you can find it a lot of people talking about it on Twitter and on TikTok. Uh, a lot of creators who I deeply respect have decided not to cover the show because of this, and I think that's a very understandable pers- pers- uh, that's a very understandable position. I think we've decided that we are going to cover the show, but we do still want to make sure we we keep this men- this idea in mind that we encourage people to check out those resources because I do think that you can both really enjoy a lot of things Star Wars is doing and also say, hey, Star Wars, you're dropping the ball on some stuff, you know? And I think a lot of us fans pointed out that with characters like Finn and with um, Rose that the characters of color were not treated well. And I don't think that, I think Reva is a sign that they're getting at least a little bit better in some regards. The fans, not quite so much, but but Star Wars itself, better in some ways, still Still maybe not the best. And I think – so I think – I definitely encourage you to at least check this out and learn more about the issue. If it is an issue that's important to you the way it's important to me, I would definitely encourage you to you know sign the petitions or take actions in other ways that they talk about it there. 
as I said, we are going to still keep going with this podcast because I think there's a lot of great content to, to be discussed. But I think it's important to name that context and just say, hey, this is a larger issue around the show that I want people to know about. Yeah, I agree. I think that's very important. I think we've seen the clones become more whitewashed as time has gone on. Mm-hmm. And especially with the Bad Batch, the way, like you mentioned, they don't look like other clones. Right. And therefore, they're also lighter skinned is just wrong. Yeah. 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 I don't think it's true. So I think there we're going to wrap up the normal part of our show. It is the new year and as I've been talking about for a while, I'm relaunching the Patreon. Uh, this is a wonderful show. I... I love putting the show on. I love putting on superhero ethics. I love making podcasts for you all. And I love the audience feedback we get. I love all the great guests we get. Uh, but this is, it's a labor of love, but but it's a labor. And uh, if you're able to just spare a couple of bucks a month uh, to help support us, what we're doing by going to Patreon, uh, the link is going to be in the show notes, but also just patreon.com, The Ethical Panda. It would mean the world to us. Uh, right now, we have a couple of great patrons who have already been supporting the podcast for a while. We've been kind of going through some back and forth as to what we're doing at the Patreon. So I'm so grateful to these folks, uh, Dr. Kyle Berkeley, Paul Dr. Kyle Berkeley, Paul Schneider, Winston Gordon, uh, Megan Lachowski, and Mary McCreary have all been great, great patrons of the show. I would love to really increase those numbers. And it's very small because I said I've kind of like let it be dormant for a while. One of the things we're going to start doing is recording bonus content at the end of every episode that uh, will tie into the episode. Sometimes we'll go deeper into a question. Sometimes we will uh, just get into more of a different thing. Sometimes we'll talk about like what else we're watching. It's always going to be interesting. Uh, as patrons, uh, as patrons, you can get access to ad-free content. At a certain level, you can get access to that bonus content. You'll definitely get our thanks at a higher enough level. You can get... Um, the Ethical Panda or Star Wars Universe podcast or Superhero Ethics merch or even get uh, to help us design an episode. Becoming a patron is such a good way to help support the show uh, and we really have your thanks. So we'll do that bonus content in just a few moments. Uh, you're going to hear it today for free, but this will be the last time after today it will be for patrons only. Uh, but so as we wrap up, Aaron, let me just ask for people who are interested in what you're doing. Uh, I know you're doing so much awesome stuff with cosplay and stuff like that. Tell them a little about what you're doing and where they can find you. Yeah, so my online presence for Star Wars is mostly cosplay things. As you said, um, I cosplay Ahsoka Tano, specifically her season seven um, outfit and all that. Currently, I'm remaking my Leku again, <laughs> um, which is her headdress. So that's what I'm documenting right now. I've been posting some stuff. I did some Christmas content too, or holiday content. Yep. Um, yeah, so my handles are lady period tano period creates that's on tiktok and on instagram i tend to be a little more active on tiktok but yeah if you want to check me out go ahead and drop a follow on either of those yeah it's definitely worth creating i have always been so amazed at the whole cosplay process and it, it's one of the things that just seemed like magic you know kind of like right. and, and like i don't know how this happens i don't know where this happens uh, and watching you do it you know from literally from scratch has been really such an interesting educational process so thank you so much for doing that as as i mentioned this podcast is part of the ethical panda that's kind of my my gnome de plume online uh, if you go to theethicalpanda.com, there you'll find this podcast, Superhero Ethics Podcast, all the other podcasting I do. Most importantly, there, though, there you can find ways to contact us. We would love feedback. I'd love to hear more of what you're thinking about this show. Um, send us your thoughts. Send us your questions. If you want us to discuss on air, send us the ways you agree or disagree with stuff we've said. Say whatever you want. All the ways to contact us are there and also in the show notes. Uh, so we're going to have one more quick ad break and then get you that bonus content right after this. Welcome back. So, Aaron, we're going to talk about a bunch of different things during this bonus content. I'm going to kind of give people a little bit of smorgasbord because we're going to do one or two of the quest. We're going to do, we're going to hit a couple of things here. And I'm not going to make the bonus content clone thirst hour. Oh. But <laughs> I, I know uh, the disappointment though there. But but I want to start with that because I do know – I know a lot of fans who – you know, they, you talk about like MCU thirst, they're with you. you they talk about like Din Djarin or, you know, uh-huh. uh, and or like those are some incredibly attractive men or Daddy Juan Kenobi. They get uh. it. But I definitely know some folks who when I say, oh, yeah, one of the other biggest sources of thirst is the clones who in a, in a there's the animated thing, which for some people is a barrier. I don't think it should be by any means, but also – you know, the initial presentation of them is that they're all the same. They're all kind of, you know, just these warrior boys. 
Talk to me about clone thirst. Explain what, what that is and where it's about. Well, I think... Remembering that this is a family-friendly podcast. <laughs> of course. Of course. I'll keep it tame. Um, I think a lot of it has to do with what you said, how they are all the same. But it's the fact that they are still so different, like fighting for their own individuality. Like I've always just found that so like attractive, like someone who's not scared to say how they feel or like, you know, give themselves their own name. Maybe it's funny. Maybe it's cut up. Maybe it's droid bait, you know? Right. Maybe it's literally just taking the fact that your coat, like so much of the names is about getting away from their code numbers. Mm -hmm. And one person's like, oh, I've got a lot of five in my code number. Sure, I'm fives, you know? Exactly. Yeah. And I like like the way that they decorate their armor. Like it's all just very endearing to me in a way that turns into thirst because I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, like my sweet babies. And then they like throw a couple grenades and like blast a battalion of droids. And I'm like... And that was kind of hot. Like, what can I yeah. say? They get sh they get things done, you know. Like that's fair. <laughs> I mean, I think I always I really like what you say about the, like the the desire to express themselves in a place where that's difficult, different, you know, because difficult because I, and I've commented on this before, but you know, masculine presenting people, masculine presenting people, at least you know, in our world, certainly the rules about how we're supposed to you know express ourselves, uh, you know how much like we can go, go outside the lines and stuff like that is pretty limited often you know you'll find like how does a guy express himself at a fancy dress event well the color of his tie or something like that you know and and there's i think obviously you can push further and further with that that's why i love being dapper and all of that kind of thing mm -hmm. but for me there's something really beautiful about all these people literally look exactly the same and they could look exactly the same, but instead they are choosing to find ways to express their individuality through their appearance, through their demeanor, as well as just the – and I think this is also part of it. I'm curious your thoughts on this. You know, one of the things that I – I've always been fascinated by fan fiction and stuff like that. And I remember there's some great like documentaries and, and articles about it. And it talks about how where a lot of it started was especially with like someone like Kirk and Spock and it's kind of the original fan slash fanfic. The reason why a lot of women were often so into it was that this was men showing vulnerability to each other and sharing emotions with each other, something that is becoming more common but is still so rare. And that for them, it was just so hot for like Spock and Kirk to be able to like have a, emotions towards each other. And, and I think that's what we get with the clones so much is that – I mean, a lot of them, we never we never see them around anyone who isn't a clone, let alone whatever gender they are. But yeah, but they're not just like, yeah, yeah, well, you know, you saved my life, I saved yours, you know, smack you on the butt and I'll insult you. Like, they have deep emotional, like, heartfelt conversations with deserters and with people who leave and with people who stay and with people who are on different sides of these conflicts. And it's just, yeah, it's sexy as hell. Yeah. Yeah. That was something I just wrote down while you're talking because I didn't want to forget just a piece of what is so attractive is how kind they are. Like they're soldiers and they're tough, but like uh, the episodes where, oh, this is definitely where it started. I just, I just pinpointed my clone thirst where it started it. was, I think it's season one of Clone Wars, the episode Innocence of Ryloth. It's mm. the clones Waxer and Boyle. Um, they're part of the 212th, which is uh, Obi-Wan's battalion. But um, they're doing some kind of like recon on this abandoned city on Ryloth, which is where the Twi'leks are from. And they run across this like little girl. She's like six, seven, you know, very yeah. well. I don't know how Twi'leks age, but she looks about that age. Right. And she has a little stuffed animal and she's just like very scared, like kind of is following them but hiding they try to go up to her she mm -hmm. runs away and just the like gentleness they treat her with like Boyle no it's yeah Boyle's kind of like okay let's move on you know she can follow us if she right. wants but she's just like a street urchin Waxer's like maybe she's hungry like she's all alone and we see them both kind of soften to her and they end up like trusting her and she saves them from getting eaten by these animals right and I just, I think just seeing, yeah, like a strong, powerful man just being so soft towards someone is 
Mm. It's very attractive. <laughs> no, I can understand that. I mean, Dale Fanergy is very strong in Star Wars these days, you know, whether it's from yeah. uh, Dean yeah. Jaren, uh to, you know, them with Omega. And I think that's a very good thing. And I think that's uh, – for me as someone who's very committed to unpacking toxic masculinity and seeing that, like, I think it's, I think it's good to be able to talk about – like, hey, yeah, it's just fun to talk about what's sexy, and I certainly find a lot of attractiveness in them as well. I, I'm someone for whom, like, a cartoon – an animated character being something I find attractive, that's still a line I'm just not quite at because I didn't grow up with, with animated stuff the same way. Mm -hmm. But I can definitely see it. I think it's fun to talk about, and it's good to talk about. But also, yeah, but I think that there's – it's – you know, every now and then I see some of those videos that are like, oh, well, you know, real men know that this is what women want. And there'll be a thousand women in the TikTok being like, no, no, that's not what we want. Shut up. <laughs> and then the guys who live at the gym the whole time are like, no, no, you're lying. This is clearly what you want. And it's mm -hmm. just – yeah, to me, the clones – I think it's worth noting that this is why people find the clones so attractive, you know, um, but for many reasons. Also, the tattoos that may well go down their entire body. <laughs> that's oh, my thing. God. <laughs> I'll never not blush when it comes up. Like, it's just so hot. Like mm – -hmm. I, I get it. I get it. Yeah. And so I think, again, I don't want to get too far into that topic, but I will just say for folks who are a little still con concerned, uh, for folks who are still a little, con you know, curious about this further, uh, archive of our own, look for Clone War stuff, and uh, you'll find quite a lot about uh, different clone pairings and the like uh, and, and combinations. Definitely worth checking out. So another one of the kind of topics we're going to get into from time to time is just what else are we consuming as fans these days? Um, so... Obviously, I know you've been doing a lot of stuff with um, the cosplay recently. Um, the holidays have just come. And I know for you, you were trying to get from one frozen part of Hoth to another part of yep. frozen Hoth in the country. <laughs> and so uh, – but like if you had a chance, like what else have you been consuming media-wise, either within Star Wars or outside of it? Yeah. Um, within Star Wars, I've been working my way through the book – I read a book and then I've been reading another book, but I read through Convergence. I also listened through it because that just helps me remember things better. Mm -hmm. And that's set in the um, High Republic. No, actually, it's about 200 years before the High Republic era. So the Old Republic. And that's just like a really good book. It's not overly steeped in like Republic versus, you know... Sith versus like this versus that. It's very it's about this these two worlds and the politics that go on between them and the yep. feud that they've had for hundreds of years and how a possible marriage can like fuse these worlds together and really like bridge the gap to peace. And so it was just a very it's a good read. It's a very fun book. You know, we have like these yeah. four main characters. They have a really nice kind of um chemistry going on between all of them yeah i think actually we're gonna it's a book that i also really love there's a lot to get into and i think for our bonus content for episode two we'll actually do just like 10 minutes about that book because it's definitely worth discussing yeah and i think you said you're reading one of the high republic books now yes yeah i'm reading the second book in the light of the jedi series so that's the one about like avar chris and elzar man mm -hmm. and that's really good it's focusing or it's about the Nihil, again. Nihil? Right. Whatever. They're the bad guys. <laughs> yep. Um, and yeah, I'm about halfway through. I just really love the way these books are written. And it's very mm -hmm. impressive that they're different authors. Yeah. Like, so far, the first and second book are blending really well together. They're following all the, like, anything left open in the second book. Any awkwardness is being, like, addressed and dealt with. In yeah. the second book, sorry, from the first book. So, yeah, I would just recommend that whole series, but specifically mm -hmm. the second book is really grabbing my attention. Yeah, I've really been enjoying them. Um, but the High Republic and some of the other newer canonical books, but especially the High Republic books, I think, among other things, they're doing a very good job of showing that the the rigidness of the Jedi, particularly around the matters like uh, attachments and the like, that we get to by the time of Anakin – has not always been true throughout the Jedi reign. And and that I think it's, it's interesting to see, you know, how things were a lot more lax back then and that that was good in some ways and bad in some ways. And also just getting to see the Jedi doing Jedi things that aren't necessarily like all leading up to the fall the way they were during the prequels. So that's been a lot of fun. Uh, we'll definitely talk more about those. For myself, um, 
I have gotten sucked back into the world of the Vampire Diaries. I have been watching Legacies, which has been um, – it's trashy, but it's also hitting all of my like favorite things of like interesting stories of supernatural creatures, but how can they exist and can they exist and can they not exist and like the ethics of that, plus all the stuff I love about like you know vampy high school drama. So yes. it's just hitting me right in the feels. I'm <laughs> loving that. Um Started rewatching Doctor Who, which I think is a thing I'll definitely be talking about at some points over on superhero ethics. Um, Doctor Who is good. It is. I need to is. get back to it. I I fell off the train for a while. I've gotten back onto it. We're going back and rewatching some Matt Smith, and I'm going to probably finally get to some of the newer Doctors. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the last thing was I did a whole binge of Star Girl, which I don't know if you've seen. It, it's a DC show. It's very much like. Supergirl in some ways. In some ways, I'm a little like, I wish they had... I, she's a teenager, not an adult. The villain at the end of season one is almost the exact same set of motivations as the villain for, for Supergirl, which is a little weird. But it was just yeah. fun to dive back into the, the DC world. It's by no means the best of the Arrowverse DC shows, <laughs> but it's been it's been fun at least to kind of check out. Yeah. What about for you? Anything good you've been watching? Yeah, something I've just been watching the last few days is um, Murderville. It's on Netflix, Ooh, and it's okay. hosted by Will Arnett. He's a comedian. Um, he plays Lego Batman. That's his claim to fame, for sure. Yep. Nothing else, he's, just that. He's done one or two more <laughs> things, but he, I think he should be in the conversations of the best Batmans, absolutely. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's about this detective, Terry Seattle, and he's like the typical, like, oh, I only work alone, senior detective. My partner was killed 15 years ago, and I've never been the same since. Who's playing the- Batman again? Exactly. And so it's like, <laughs> but it's all satire and it's all comedic. And every episode he gets a new partner and it's like uh-huh. a guest celebrity. So like they had like Sharon Stone. They had. Um, oh, wow. Kumail. Giovanni. Yeah. Thank you. I was like, I don't know how to say his last name. And then they had Marshawn Lynch, the football player. Oh, and wow, okay. so the catch is they have a guest detective but they're not given a script and they don't know what the case is and so this guest has to improv their way through the entire episode and then at the end they're the (laughs) one who has to like present the murderer with the handcuffs and like decide who did it and then the chief comes in and she's like what's going on and then she'll state whether or not they're correct cool it's so fun it's It's like a little celebrity murder game show yeah, I was like half like TV show, half game show, reality show. Okay, I can get yeah. into this. I can get into this. No, um, they're fun little twenty minute episodes. Definitely worth a watch. Okay, okay. I I've uh, the other thing I've been recently doing is um, this sounds good. It sounds like good light content, which is helpful because the other content that I started c- consuming recently. All of my friends I know who've been super into Star Wars, we're talking about Andor a lot, but also Mandalorian fans were, were going crazy over The Last of Us. And uh, I didn't really, really understand why until they realized, oh, it's because uh, – I think it's Pedro Pascal is going to be yep. the, the star of uh, The Last of Us. And I mentioned this to my partner and she's a video game person. I'm not. She's like, oh, yeah, I love The Last of Us video game. Let's play through that. Uh, and which means like she'll play it and I get to sit on the couch and yep. watch. Cause that's like, how I like to play video games too. Right? Yeah. I'm like, let's, let's throw out gender norms here. Um, <laughs> but it's funny because I knew nothing about the game and I'm not going to spoil anything. It is very dark and it's very dark, very fast. And so like having something, uh, you know, a little, little lighter hearted to, to check in on might, might not, might be a nice d- distraction. So it's, it's called Murderville. Murderville, yeah. Sounds super okay. light and airy, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. All right. Well, Aaron, as always, thank you so much. Um, to all of our listeners, thank you so much for checking in. Please uh, follow us on the social media. Talk to us. Let us know what you think. Please think seriously about uh, signing on for Patreon. Uh, whatever you can do to help is greatly appreciated. Share this with your friends. Help more people find this. Uh, let's get more people in the conversation. I'm having myself, Aaron. Thank you all for listening. Have a great day. Bye.